Hello out there. My name's Markley, and you're listening to Low Profile. My guest today is Phil Elvram. Phil's been making music under the moniker Mount Erie, named for a mountain in Washington since 2003. Prior to that, he made music as the Microphones. We'll get to the origin of that band name later. I first met Phil in the mid-2000s in his hometown, Anacortes, Washington, a small town where for years he helped organize What the Heck Fest, a music festival that drew acts and audience members from the world over. In the last 25 years, he's been taking his music all over this earth and has released and produced a ton of music and visual art. On his latest album, he goes back to being the microphones again. Simply titled Microphones in 2020, he delivers a sung memoir on his music career so far over the course of a single 45-minute song. There's a really beautiful video of it that you can find online, too. I called my friend Phil to chat about the new record, his winter isolated in a rural cabin in Norway, photography, his hilarious cartoons, writing about life and death, and pretty much everything but hamburgers. But don't worry, he did send me a haiku on that subject. And here it is, read by documentarian Steve Rowland. When I'm chainsawing, my mind wanders through sawdust to thoughts of night meat. Thanks, Steve. If you like this show and you want to help it keep growing, you can subscribe to the show wherever you get podcasts. Patreon.com slash low profile is a spot where you can throw us a few bucks. I've also been putting more stuff on Instagram at lowpropodcast.com for people who like to look at things. If you want a sticker or a button, just ask. Life hack. The buttons work really well to connect a face mask behind a kid's head. And the stickers will fit right over your eyes if it's ever all too much for you to take in. And it lets people know that you love the show. Here's my conversation with the original lineup of the microphones. Well, Phil, thanks so much for uh, setting aside a little time to chat tonight. My pleasure. Um, And I'm assuming you're at home? Yeah. Yeah. What's it like up there right now? Well, I'm on Orcus. And uh, I just put my daughter to bed. I'm pretty sure she's asleep. And we went swimming in the lake today. And it was raining while we did that. (laughs) We were like the only people parking and getting out of our cars and getting our swimming suits on. Well, the rain started and all the tourists were like running for their cars. (laughs) (laughs) And we're the like lone local maniacs who are suiting up. Like buying an ice cream cone <laughs> and eating it in the lake. And so, yeah. Orcas, just for the <clears throat> listener, is it's just a, an island out here that um, is near where I grew up. And so, yeah, that's where we live now. You have a new album under the moniker The Microphones, which you haven't used for about 17 <clears throat> years. In the interim, you've been extremely productive with Mount Erie recording under that name this this new microphones record I I had heard that it was coming I I knew it was imminent and uh and I got it last week and I was I was really surprised uh when I heard it I kind of went in blind so um Hmm. it was not at all what I expected uh but I wonder what you expected. I don't. I don't know what I expected, but um, it it's a uh, it's a story. Yeah. Yeah. It's more. It's more of a podcast. <laughs> very. Very good. Or yeah. An audio book or something. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's kind of its own thing. It kind of like felt like an answer to fan letters, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> in some way. He, yeah, maybe. And also listening to it, uh, I feel like a lot of the questions I've been bouncing around to ask you were directly addressed in the lyrics <laughs> wherein I'm like, oh. Yeah, right. It's sort of like a audio press release also. 
Yeah. Where's the end credits roll? I decided I would try to make music that contained this deeper peace buried underneath distorted bass fog imbued with light and emptiness. I kept on driving out to the ocean. Well, yeah, I always, I mean, don't you feel like the, one of the ideals of music is that it is self-evident or that it should, the artwork should stand on its own? This one, I just like went the extra mile to make it self-explanatory, right? Yeah, that was some of the thinking that went into it. Oh, uh, it, it couldn't be clearer. And so <laughs> it's basically just, a, 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 yeah, a written account of the career of the microphones uh, into Mount Erie. And then um, I got to admit, I chuckled uh, at one point. You uh, sang a lyric about uh, fixation on the singer's face or on the band name mm -hmm. keeps us groveling and blind at the edge of a sea. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after this, uh, I chuckled when you said, so what if I call this song Microphones in 2020? Yeah, I tried to make it um, straight up autobiographical narrative, but also I tried to insert lots of reflection and poetry and ambiguity in there as well. It's there's a lot of um, breathing room, and yeah, the, the the mystery that goes with artwork, I think, or that needs to. It's not pure uh, data. Sure. There, yeah, there's lots of exploration in there. Yeah, and a lot of uh, I don't I don't know I really enjoyed uh, some of the musical references that you threw in, um, mm -hmm. like there's uh, the part where you mentioned seeing Stereo Lab in Bellingham, and then the soundtrack becomes sort of reminiscent of Stereo Lab, just this heavy throbbing, pounding drone. I saw Stereo Lab in Bellingham. They played one chord for. Something in me shifted I brought back home Belief I could create Eternity Moving the guitar up on me Taping down organ keys Feeding back forever Distorted waves of symbols Ocean Slowly starting to try To know the words beyond Mere melancholy I like that transition right there when it shifts into that organ distorted bass part. Yeah, musically, I like that moment. For a long time, I've wanted to make a really long song, and this idea of a certain chord progression or like a certain riff or whatever that has the magic to it where you don't notice that time is passing and it could just go and go and you don't know. You're like, oh, that song's 15 minutes long? Whoa, weird. There are a few songs like that and I always wanted to write one and it was after just playing these chords together I realized, hey, this could be my one of those. This could be my hypnotic riff. And then I pushed it. <laughs> I pushed it to the extreme to see how long I could go with it. And you've done... You've done long songs for sure in in the mm -hmm. past, uh, you know. That's true. All, all sorts of lengths, but you you definitely like you know exceeded ten fifteen minutes. Um, yeah, that's but, true. But what? But with like different sections, those are all almost like miniature operas or something. Like they sort of they're not the same thing all the way through. With this one, I wanted it to be yeah that hypnotic um, common thread all the way through. Was The Glow part one, was that your first uh, lengthy composition? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I was a teenager, 
there was a song on one of my tapes that was maybe like seven minutes long or eight minutes long but and it sort of had this like three or four minute long um synthesizer intro so that doesn't nice. count maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> real epic proggy wait for it teen. wait for it yeah just yeah. building up the tension it yeah wires and chords that song's called it's not so bad actually i still kind of like that one but yeah the glow part one is long but yeah again it's like all these different sections so it's sort of like three or four songs yeah and then then there was this song called spring on the album sauna that i think is like 13 minutes and that one does have the same note droning for the whole time i think it's c sharp but um yeah, I had this idea that I would make just this high uh, chimes, like extended, like Steve Reich kind of, like ch this rhythmic chime thing happening, oh, that yeah. all of the other movements in the song would work, would be chords moving around that worked with whatever that drone note was. And uh, yeah, that that one is longish. I love some Steve Reich. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the best. Day. Uh, yeah, it, that's a, like one of those musical things that goes beyond music, where it's like it gets into restructuring what your brain is doing. <laughs> sort of like, yeah, the band Sun feels that way to me too, where it's like it somehow goes beneath music and moves, moves around like deeper parts of your mind and body. Yeah, be bef before your mind even has the chance to think of it as music, it's like. It's like a really clumsy, negative massage in a bad sauna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I had often wondered about uh, just the name, the microphones, and simple enough. Uh, yeah, I, I explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I, li it was, I, I liked microphones. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> I, was a, I was a teenager and I liked recording. I think it's a still it's a interesting name. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm too close to it to have any perspective, but I the reason I stopped using it was just because I wasn't actually singing about recording anymore. At first, I was literally singing about recording and gear and um, vaguely metaphorically singing about it, but still singing about you know I had a song called compressor and I had a song called preamp I am a preamp plug the chords right in my head I've got headphones stuck right into my shirt I'm a guitar amp I bite the chord between my teeth my voice is the speaker And my eyes tell how loud I am I've got microphone fingers I don't care about phantom power And I know the levels Because I'm a preamp for everything Um, my writing had moved away from that, so it had moved more towards something that would could be described as Mount Erie. Plus, yeah, for many other reasons, I changed the name of it. But really, the the name, who cares? I mean, it's it's just the package that all of these other di ideas arrive in, and. I, I care way more about those other ideas rather than the packaging, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. I mean, if, if anything, it's just a, an easy way to look up your music. Or exactly. It's like a categorization tool. Same with genre distinctions and all of that. It all is sort of an outgrowth of the commodification of music and um, how it has to... It's like an art form that has to conform a little bit to capitalism or to yeah to commerce so people can feed themselves 
so I've I've seen Mount Erie performances. I don't I don't even know how many. Um, but yeah, you know I never know what I'm gonna get um, unless someone tells me what you did last night in the previous town. Um, I like to make the tours be sort of whole different productions, whole different worlds. I've never really wanted to have a static band. Yeah, I I think the first first Mount Erie lineup I ever saw was with uh was uh Jason Anderson and uh I believe a Norwegian drummer. Yeah, Shetil. Shetil Jensen. fun tour that was amazing oh yeah i caught that so loud three times it was face melting yeah it was absolutely face melting just no bass either just two guitars and drums it was pretty ramshackle we did we were trying to make i don't know what it was it wasn't metal or hardcore exactly it was somewhere in between i didn't know how to sing my songs over the top of really loud music so i just like halfway yelled them halfway strained my voice trying to sing it was so fun Ugh, we played this house show in reno on that tour it was um <laughs> just the words house show in reno mm-hmm. S- say wow. say enough <laughs> but <laughs> yeah it was so fun i loved that i didn't even know reno messed around like that it was it seemed rare this little tiny smoke-filled room on top of the hill and uh yeah just, i miss that i here we are in this pandemic with no concerts at all but if if and when it does come back that's the type of show i miss the most is like making 13 dollars in donations and <laughs> not not selling any merch and sleeping on a cinder block <laughs> oh yeah nothing in the just, world like it yeah yeah it feels great it's <laughs> Um, the show, but yeah, me, that version of artistic expression, it feels so fun. I miss it a lot. Yeah. And you know, I feel like your music is designed for uh, a more intimate environment. Yeah. It, well, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just close my eyes when I sing, so I don't know where I am, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, yeah, bridging the gap between myself and whoever's listening that's the goal so that seems like it would work better in a living room yeah i i mean you can imagine what olympia is like with no house shows it just seems like a ghost town yeah yeah i can imagine is the track house still a thing are, are shows happening there what's going on with that house i'm curious the track house so that's that's the uh it's a black house uh, mm-hmm. next to the railroad tracks uh, downtown Olympia and I feel like I did hear about a show happening there toward the beginning of the year uh, it's not as active like in in recent memory as it had been you know say in the previous couple decades uh-huh. uh, uh, you lived in that house right? yeah that was my I lived in a few houses in Olympia, but those years at the track house were my favorite. Those were like my most productive years there, and it was just the best. The location, and it was the cheapest house. There were four of us in the house. We all got along great, and it was right by a dub narcotics studio. I feel like such fond memories of that that dump. (laughs) But I should say, before living in the track house, I lived in the house of doom, which it was like legitimately haunted and later burned down at a party and doesn't exist anymore it was on the east side 
on what, do, Quince. what do you mean legitimately haunted i didn't experience ghost stuff but like so many people probably like five different people told me very plausible really truly scary encounter stories with with like sleeping in their bed in the house and then like a barrel full of rats who dumps out on them and they like scramble and and then they wake up and there are no rats or and you're just like or hear hearing and seeing presences and then like digging a hole in the yard and finding this um canister of putrid black liquid <laughs> that's Ooh. another story i remember wow. plus the vermin at that house was so extreme the um the r- rats in the kitchen and the raccoon raccoons in the kitchen like inside <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah, it was intense like some fun roommates it was somehow yeah i lived there in 1999 i recorded um don't wake me up my first album there so happy just to have a place to live with cheap rent and walk down to the studio every night and I think maybe I had stopped going to Evergreen already by that point did you move to Olympia to go to Evergreen uh, halfway I mean I, I knew also that I wanted to just do music but the momentum of my life like my family my grandparents were definitely like we have got this college funds for you. We're we're public educators for our careers, our whole lives. We all go to college. Go to college here. And so, yeah, Evergreen was like my excuse to go to Olympia, and I went for two quarters before just being like, this is not for me. And also, I have this whole other thing going on outside of Evergreen, just through K. School of life. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just sort of already happening, and I felt like all the other people I was in school with didn't really know what they wanted to do they were sort of using school to figure themselves out and i i already figured myself out i was like doing it i was recording at dub narcotic and touring Mm. so school seemed like um a distraction when you were touring did you have a microphones band or no 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 i mean there would be occasional times where I would get a band together for a couple of shows or for one show or a short tour or something. But no, I I, I remember feeling like uh, my favorite band slash like art, recording artist person when I was a teenager and kind of still is this guy named Rick White from uh, Canada, from New Brunswick, Canada. And he was in this band called Eric's Trip and they, they were on sub pop and they had albums they're great but then he had this like four track project of his own called elevator to hell and i loved it so much it was so raw and so elemental and just intimate and weird and um those the first elevator to hell record was so special to me and then he formed a band to play some elevator to hell shows and then instead of disbanding after those shows just kept the band and wrote new songs as the band and recorded new albums as the band and it just became like it sounded like a band playing Mm -hmm. to me that was sort of like a cautionary tale don't do that with your weird recording project if you (laughs) even though it's so fun to play music with a band and play with other people some you lose something with that um collaborative camaraderie you lose whatever that weirdness is that comes from being isolated and doing your recording experiments and so i didn't want to solidify like that yeah it's like when when you're one person working with say a four track or an eight track it's almost like you can focus on like four or eight different parts of your own personality or you know various personalities that you have Mm -hmm. and um 
you know, make make a band out of all the different parts of your brain. Yeah. And well, and also, it's going to be off. It's going to not sound like the chemistry of a band playing. It's going to be a little like incorrect and weird. But it, to me, that's so interesting. The way that's what um, home recording can do is that the way that it's off, and that just can't be replicated by the chemistry of people playing music with each other which is also cool but it's its own separate thing and there's plenty of it in the world <laughs> yeah when i looked out across the freeway at the people flying by i turned my head i closed my eyes i felt my size i recalled my fire and my lack of dawn my one-sided warmth I just want it more But I'm smart Yeah, now you 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 referenced Eric's trip and elevator to hell in mm-hmm. microphones in twenty twenty and I, I actually I'm not familiar. I, I've heard of Eric's trip. Uh but you you also mentioned Lou Barlow and he's one of the mm-hmm. first artists that I heard like that just was like, Oh, you can this is allowed? Great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what Eric's trip did for me. And I think Eric's trip was definitely inspired by Lou Barlow as well. I think a lot of people were. I think he was pretty elemental and, and like life changing for a lot of people all over the world who discovered that it was like a permission slip for home recording. Lou Barlow and then also for me Carl Blau was somebody that I heard that was just like, What? You're allowed to, that counts as music? You're allowed to just do that? <laughs> wow, okay. And, Amazing. And he was your neighbor, right? He lived like across the water from Anacortes. He lived on Samish Island and he was in this band called Captain Fathom, which was in my sphere of my bands, my like teenage band that I was the drummer in, would sometimes play shows, Grange Hall shows with Captain Fathom. We were sort of doing different things. They were like hippie jam rock and we were I don't even know what, very bad uh goth punk uh-huh. <laughs> songs about food <laughs> and um <laughs> doesn't get much more goth than that <laughs> yeah our hit was jello but um a oh, roll roll clip <laughs> yeah <laughs> you'll never find it it's successfully erased i know people <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, but yeah, he- hearing Carl's four track stuff was truly life changing. Or even knowing that, like, I didn't even know what four track stuff was until Carl walked into the business when I was working there as a teenager. And just, yeah, oof. He's good. Uh, you know, the first microphone song I ever heard was given to me on a mixtape back in uh well yeah probably 2000 2001 and the song was called carl blau and Mm -hmm. little did i know that that name which i thought was just a song title would uh you know become a dear friend he's actually going to be on the episode following this one so there will be a little bit of continuity there great well this is a little bump yeah like rate review subscribe comment
as far as I can tell, you're perceived by many to be a very serious, somber artist. Most of your mm. art comes across that way, like in your photography, your lyrics mm -hmm. are very deep and introspective, and you you have the most ridiculous, wacky comics that you've drawn <laughs> <laughs> that um, mm -hmm. some of my favorite some of my favorite comics I've seen crude uh, <laughs> unruly it's called fancy people adventures is that still something people can find the website is down it's and down. I haven't had yeah oh man the, well there's there's yeah, this great a... comic where uh, there's a there's a big party going on and this guy walks in <laughs> and uh, he's he's saying party yeah woo hey who wants to listen to my four track stuff <laughs> yep <laughs> That's real. That's yeah. A, that's, a, that's a real person. A real person would do that. Have you ever been that yeah. guy? No. No. I've always been like, please nobody listen to my four track stuff. <laughs> or I'll like leave it. I'll, leave, I'll like anonymously leave it on a park bench. But <laughs> that comic, I wish I was more, I, was, I wish I was still doing them. The most productive times of making that comic were when I lived at the track house, actually, and I lived with my great friend, Jason Wall. He was like a mathematics student at Evergreen, and he just would say say amazing things, like hilarious, weird, non-sequitur things. He it was like a form of Tourette's or something. He would just blast out these amazing one-liners. With, without even like anyone listening, he would just be in his room shouting things. Just an, a crazy genius weirdo. And the comic grew out of me just writing them down and say, and just documenting them and like making them come out of a get the mouth of a crazy looking character. Or being on a family trip with my little brother and trying to document the jokes between us. But... Yeah, thanks for the compliments about those. I, I do like them still. I want to both resume drawing comics and also make some kind of book of the old ones and fix the website. Yeah, you got to get that website fixed. So much um, has has happened from uh, microphones to microphones 2020, and I feel like the um, the first thing I ever read about you was when you had it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, um, had recorded the album Mount Erie, mm -hmm. and that had something to do with you spending some time isolated in Norway? It was around the same time, yeah, but uh, I actually recorded it in Olympia during my last last year in Olympia, living at the track house, and finished it up and then moved out of the track house, moved into the back of my 79 Toyota pickup, and just went on tour forever, which ended up in northern Norway. So yeah, but but it didn't actually come out until the following spring. So maybe maybe people make that association because it came out and I was living in Arctic Norway. But actually, I associate the album Mount Erie with living in Olympia and um, just being being that person, being pre-Norway Phil. Were you conscious of that being the last? title or the the last title you would release as the microphones barely i was like halfway conscious because i knew that i really felt like there was a lot of uh potency or something a lot of a lot of meat on the name mount erie that i didn't quite feel like i got 
to the bottom of it with that album. And so I knew I wanted to explore that idea some more. And also I knew that the name The Microphones felt kind of irrelevant. And so, and then I went to Norway and had this sort of like transformative um, winter where it felt like one part of my life was distinct from another part of my life. So it seemed like a good time to just be kind of reborn, draw a line and say, this is before, this is after. What happened when you were there? Well, I lived in a cabin by myself uh, in in the winter and through the, the whole winter in the Arctic. So like above the Arctic Circle in Norway, uh, where it, the sun didn't come up for a long time. And I just, I didn't have electricity or running water. <clears throat> and I just gathered like firewood and melted ice and snow t- for drinking water and survived the winter and read books by candlelight. And it was awesome. But also it was like, I just went crazy in a really good way. I talked to myself constantly. I um, contemplated everything, like maybe too much, and reoriented my my sense of like what matters. Or I don't know. Yeah, I, I maybe had some like unresolved struggles, interpersonal struggles that I had brought there with me, and I just dealt with them one-on-one it sounds really romantic and like masculine but uh i realized in hindsight that it was like a coming of age sort of ritual that exists in traditional cultures all over the world i was sort of doing a homemade version of it for myself because we don't have that in our culture so um that's what happened is i sort of became an adult but yeah and then i came back from that and was like hello everyone i'm I'm Mount Erie. I'm here. Got these other songs, and I'm happy to be in the world again. And it felt like, yeah, like I had done a very good bath or a shower, but on my brain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, it felt great. And I felt like, ah, oh, I should do this every winter. I mean, it makes sense that it's a thing, it's a common thread that cultures all around the world do for their young people, send them off into the wilderness and make them fast or whatever for a week and then come back to the village and re-enter society. I I feel like it does something essential for our brains or for our development. Um, Yeah, I'm a believer in that. Are you going to recommend something like that for your daughter? (laughs) Maybe, yeah. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about your studio, the uh, All right. the unknown. Oh, that one. Yeah, is that? Oh, is that taboo? That's just definite. No, That's no, it's subject. not taboo. It, <laughs> no, not at all. But it's not my studio at all. It's totally Nick's studio. I haven't worked there since I don't know, like 2014, which is six years ago now. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, That's the last time I was there. You still own that giant gong? Yeah, I do have my gong. It's here. It's like deep in the forest here on Orcus. <laughs> you keep it outdoors? I I'm gonna, I, it is currently outdoors. Yeah, I'm going to hang it from a really high tree, I think, oh as a, like a wind chime. Like a bass wind chime. Something about a gong always impresses me. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty elemental. I remember when Lake was recording at The Unknown when you were still working there um and I we we were recording this like you no know, like some kind of upbeat pop number and I was like you know what this track needs is some gong <laughs> thinking that that was just totally a like a forbidden thing and you were like great yeah let's get it set up and I was like oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's not exactly upbeat. It's kind of pretty um, metal tone. It was an investment. I bought that gong thinking I'll need this forever, but (laughs) I've moved it across the country and back to different houses. It takes up a lot of space. It's enormous, and it makes one sound. 
but yeah. it's cool. It's the one really good sound that it makes. Speaking of uh, heavy metal, when did you start getting into that realm? Oh, not that early. Not, yeah, it, it was sort of later that I started actually listening to uh, music that would be called metal, I guess. I, I do remember reading the book Lords of Chaos, which is like a tabloidy kind of expose about all the church burning and murders and stuff in Norway in the early 90s. I remember reading that book, and I think that was in the year 2000. Somebody had it at the studio, and I remember reading it while I was, like, pressing record, stop, rewind, pause, record. Like, yeah, just doing all the punch-ins and stuff. Mm -hmm. With my eyes, I was reading that book. But I never heard the music. I was just reading this salacious biographical stuff about these Norwegian teenagers, and I imagined the music from the descriptions. It was probably like five or six years later that I actually heard the music, and I was so unimpressed. I was like, what? This is what black metal sounds like? But um, it's just because it sounded so thin and shrieky and teen to me. But in relation to their reputation that preceded them, yeah. But yeah, since since then, I I don't know. I think I've always liked musical extremes, e extremely quiet and extremely loud and dense and uh, oppressive production tones. Oh yeah, you're not but, afraid to get into the red on the on the meters. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Why? Why be shy about it? If you're gonna make something, just make it all the way. Yeah. The last few Mount Erie records were just very, um, well, very somber, and for for good reason, because those were mm -hmm. uh, some some grief stricken art projects. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I didn't I didn't want to make I didn't I tried to like not even have production of any kind. <laughs> I just was trying to get the ideas across with those ones. Yeah. And for the listener, that's uh, your your wife, Jean-Vievre, of 12 years, had passed from cancer. And, um, yep. God, it, it was just a, a devastating moment for all of all of the people that knew her and, um, yeah. and knew you. And it was it was a real surprise to me that you were even able to to pull that off and put into words was the creative energy just impossible to stop at that point it kind of i don't know i think i was mostly just on autopilot uh i also was surprised that songs were coming out of it because i wasn't trying to make them really it just maybe it was like the momentum of that's what I had always done with my thoughts and feelings for decades. Like I just translate, you know, habitually translate things into some song form. And um, it just happened. Yeah, these song ideas keep popping up and I, I just started recording them, working them. Ideas insisted themselves and... Uh, wasn't planning on putting it out until it was mostly finished and then I was like oh okay well might as well release this but yeah it it was very much like an autopilot type of thing well that you, you just you just said some things that in the just in the starkest plainest heartfelt ways that um really resonate with anyone who's dealt with loss. Um, I, I don't know if you know this, but my wife and I, we, we lost a daughter, uh, a little over a year ago. I didn't know that. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. She, she, Penelope, she didn't even make it a whole month. So, Oh, so I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. 
but I I had listened to um, just just all of those songs really really touch on grief in such a real way. And I remember still feeling like no, no one can understand. No, my devastation is unique. But people get cancer and die. People get hit by trucks and die. People just living their lives get erased for no reason With the rest of us watching from the side And some people have to survive And find a way to feel lucky to still be alive To sleep through the night I wrote down all the details of fell apart how the person I loved got killed by a bad disease out of nowhere for no reason and me living in the blast zone with our daughter and etc I made these songs and then the next thing I knew I was standing in the dirt under the desert sky at night outside Phoenix at a music festival that had paid to fly me in to play these death songs to a bunch of young people on drugs standing in the dark. It seems like you had shied away from the like straight up autobiographical experiential lyrics at, at least like in such a literal sense um, with with a lot of the Mount Erie material before that. Yeah, it's true. The one before that was sauna and it was pretty um in in some ways it was kind of out there in terms of i was trying to talk about some really heady theoretical stuff i was trying to make an album about lots of like zen buddhist zen buddhism ideas Mm -hmm. which is kind of tricky to translate into experimental music (laughs) yeah yeah. oh sauna is sauna is beautiful too thank you great title for the soundscape you've got there thanks yeah i wanted especially the song sauna i was trying to make it a song that felt like being in a sauna We haven't really talked much about your visual art. I don't think I realize to what extent uh, a shutterbug you are <laughs> until watching the microphones in 2020 lyric video, which, mm. my God, which seems like such a, a very meticulously choreographed feat. You, you're just l- slapping down a new photograph basically on the one of every beat mm-hmm. for the most part the whole song yeah. through and there's just all these moments where it's just so intentional which photograph comes down and yeah it's and true how it comes down um i mean it is it's something like over 800 photographs spanning 25 years or um, there's 796 there's I seven actually looked Oh, wow. Yeah, I think I looked it up today because I'm working on a, I I think I want to try and make a book of it, like a very, yeah, like a th- somehow make a book that has all of them in there. I like, 
I like them all. I feel like it would be nicer as a book than as a YouTube video. What was your process going into that, that video shoot? It looked like it was in one take. Well, my camera only, sh the video capacity is only 10 minutes, so I had to do it in lots of takes. But um, I tried to simulate it in one take, and I did the whole thing probably five times through with different lighting angles, trying to figure out the right to minimize the glare and according to the weather coming like the sunlight coming in the window at the right angle mm -hmm. the right time of day but yeah there was a lot most of the work was in the sequencing and organizing my photos and syncing them up and i had this complicated system of uh like the grid of the songs knowing which which uh beat every word falls on and yeah it, it was meticulous i went through for probably three weeks I was going through the photos and shuffling them around trying to sync up each photo to each line it was a lot so did you keep a camera handy through most of your at least your adult life yeah I did I always had my camera my I always yeah my first job when I was a teenager was working at the in the dark room at the business which is a record store now but it used to also be a camera store and like a family photo processing place and so i worked in the dark room as a teenager and got their weird old cameras and always had a camera with me and i would use the expired film from the business and yeah well just tons of pictures what are you working on now and, or what do you anticipate next? Is there going to be more microphones? Will there be more Mount Erie in the future? I don't know what I'm working on next. I, uh, well, I, I am working on lots of stuff right now. I'm working on lots of book projects, not just my own. I'm working on a book with Brett about Harry Smith. Um, that'll come out this year, pretty soon, oh, Harry Smith. Wow. Do you know who he is? Yeah. Oh, cool. He's come yeah. up on the program before. It's a cool, it's a wonderful <laughs> book. So, um, Harry Smith book, a, a book of Genevieve's art. Uh, and it, I do want to work on more music, but I feel like I can just let that chill for a little bit. Okay. Well, Phil, lots of love and keep up the great work. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Yeah. Take care. Thank, thank you. All right. Bye, Phil. Okay, signing off. Bye. Thank you.